So what is magical thinking? Joan Didion's magical thinking prevented her from giving away her deceased husband's shoes because in case he would need them later. Delia Robinson's magical thinking allows her a show at the Met to retell misunderstood stories, to consort with angels and have a small traveling circus, and so much more. And speculative realism, what have we here? As defined, it's theoretical rather than demonstrable, marked by questioning curiosity. Questioning? Yes, I suspect we all agree that speaks to Delia. Curiosity? Need I say more? <laughs> Delia clearly makes it demonstrable, brush or clay in hand. Hers is magical thinking. We will see it on these walls or in a conversation with Delia. Delia Robinson takes stock every year of her evolving wishes and interests. What does she want? What inspires her? She sees her life as good, quiet, and content, but something urges her to be more daring and courageous, and she knows to go for it. And from the way she lives in the world, she knows, too, that the catcher's hand will be there for her. <laughs> in taking stock, her questions are good ones. Can wildness and freedom still exist? Can we believe the lessons from our mythic past? Do the promises of a bright future come true if we follow our stars? Her answers evolve, and you may find them here. She writes, my interest in is in illuminating a personal and iconoclastic form of speculative realism. The forms that emerge in my paintings and whistles may originate in reality, but the concepts <coughs> and the meanings arrive through dreams or in that wakeful wandering across expanses of imagination, that pleasant state called the daydream. Mm -hmm. I'm hooked. Mm -hmm. The daydream. How many of us have been reprimanded for indulging in that state of apparent absence? Delia is proof that the daydream is a hugely productive state, with much great work by many has taken hold and then flourished. Delia Robinson is a storyteller, and the gallery is filled with many of her innumerable tales. She paints of places loved and lived in, her divided world where intellect reign part of the time and dream imagination and song the rest. Who told the best stories, made the best whistles, found the best berries? Those words, those worlds merge in some glorious way in every painting and in every whistle. She writes, my father had a faded packet of photos celebrating Gilbertus' stone carvings from the Autun Cathedral, carved in 1120. They fascinated me. Over the years, they've informed dozens of my paintings and sculptural whistles. Most demonstrate how much the actual stories baffle me. <laughs> ah, misunderstood stories. The flight into Egypt, for example. She writes, for me, the flight into Egypt was all about the donkey who found the trip difficult. In art, he always looks tired. Therefore, the Holy Family has rented a car with plenty of room so the donkey can ride in comfort in the back. Angels carry the luggage. Angels, a shared fascination with me and many. Her magical thinking is indeed a personal and iconoclastic form of speculative realism. Her cherished beliefs, her retelling of misunderstood stories, and for me, her flood paintings and whistles challenge the settled version, the one we learn elsewhere from a pew or a school desk. As we acquire knowledge, we debate these stories and histories, and we come to see them differently, one hopes, but I suspect not as differently as Delia. <laughs> Perhaps not as deeply felt, with so, much, with so little pretension, with so much empathy, and such self-awareness. Delia invites you in by the telling, and she keeps you there 
with the visual story. Delia Robinson merges her vast knowledge of art and art history and history and storytelling to create a unique and original, fascinating and informative, and to many, transformative world. A viewer said of Delia, her articulate imagination defies the range of possibility of mere words. Her work must be seen and lingered upon. Lucky you, you get to do so. <laughs> and I like, I need not introduce Delia, but I do want to say that this exhibit for me has been informative, restorative, oh. transformative, and a blast. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Oh. <laughs> I want that engraved all over okay. me. <laughs> Thank you for coming first off, and thanks to the to, for that wonderful talk. I'll try to live up to it. But my interest forever has been in how people turn away from, or receive, or encourage their creativity, and I for some reason, surrealists come to mind right away because they had exercises that they would do to stir up their creativity. And I don't know what I think about many of their results, although often I like them, but it is the process of how they recognized what was interesting in their minds. How do you get to that place where things break open and you start seeing things in a new way? And that kind of multi-dimensionalizing where you turn something every which way and you think, well, you know, that donkey, what did his mother think of him? What does, you know, you know what, 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 did, what, what, what would a child think of him? And all the different ways of looking at anything. And eventually, you get at something that clicks. Thank you. Everyone yeah. wants to see yeah. it. Woo. Yeah. And uh, for me, it's that little click that happens when an idea comes. And a lot of times they come in my sleep, and then I wake up and I start painting them. But there's a, a person who lives locally, M.T. Anderson Tobin, who's a writer, and he published on, on Facebook a picture of a monument in, in Italy that's the Adriatic Sea Fountain, and it shows a big, like Michelangelo, but not. It's 1890, but it's a big, chunky guy lying on top of this fountain like that. And around the fountain are sitting these sort of sloppy kids with, on their phones with their back to him. And that moment of recognizing that the, there was a something in common with the guy lounging on top of this out and the people lounging down there that I haven't figured out yet, but it made me, it was that click that made me think, ah, that's what I live for, is that little moment when two things that you never thought went together fit together. And I love that and I live for that. And, and so it's that mining of one's potential. And the more you do that in your brain, the more willing your brain is to give it up. And uh, when, and when I work, I don't want my brain there. I really don't. And so I put on books on tape, I sing, I do anything to keep my brain from being in my painting and making those little remarks that you were taught you should say about your own work, like that stinks. You know, you don't need that. You don't want to hear it, and I don't want to hear it. So I am unschooled as a painter because the people I knew who were very gifted growing up and went off to art school, most of them never painted again. And I thought, I don't want that to happen to me. And I knew how easily I would be crushed at that point in my life. And I became very gifted at painting tiny pictures you could easily hide. And uh, that's what I did for years and years and years. I also traveled a lot. So I painted pictures that were no bigger than a postage stamp. And then I got, I became a nurse because I realized I didn't have any income. And I became a nurse to pay for, pay for my paint. And they work you so hard, nobody tells you you're not going to have any energy to paint. So the pictures got even smaller and they were drawn on a pages of a calendar, one every day. I painted one picture every day. And that went on for a long time. And then I was lucky enough to get a very nice husband who's here somewhere. He's not my husband anymore, but he's still my favorite person. And, um, and he gave me a, a life where I could paint a picture. 
And that was a real thrilling moment of, of transition in my life where the unschooled painter who has all been spent their life in museums and reading, if I wasn't painting, I was had my nose in a book. And I'm like my sister Nona, who is always out in nature and became a naturalist. And I liked nature, but I was I was in my own head all the time. And I would say that my influences really are Bosch. <laughs> that sounds like I'm saying something bad. But our father, who was an old world kind of scholar, had behind, and we didn't spend all our time with him, just sometimes, but he had behind his desk a, a, the earth, Garden of Earth, you know, the Earthly Delights tri tri triptych. And I could sort of sprawl out across his desk and study these rather strange things, people with horns coming out of their butts. And uh, of course, any child would be interested. And I was <laughs> and still am. And, but I think out of that came an idea that, that the most interesting paintings were the most unexpected ones. And, and I never have, when you're painting, the next painting is the best painting is the one you're working on right that minute, right? These are all done. You can say whatever you want about them and it won't hurt me a bit. But the one that's just blooming is tender and I protect that. And when it's done, it won't be tender anymore, but it's the best. I'm thrilled about what I'm working on now, but I do recognize the problems I have with painting, which you can all see easily, are myriad. I have no a sense of it mattering what size things should be. And that might be a medieval influence because of all that medieval art that we were subjected to. If someone was important, they were real big and all the other people were real little. And I have that going on everywhere and I don't even, I don't think about it because I'm not thinking. It just happens. And so they're recurrent themes that have run all my life. And I've been surprised the other day I was rummaging in an old box and I, it had been through several moves and had never been opened. And it was just scrawls and papers and things I'd written and poems or that had jotted down that came into my head and awful things. And there was a little piece of paper on note paper that was just a scrap and it showed a fat little woman holding a chicken and her house is back up behind her, it's like a cartoon. And it says, she leaves home to go to New York City and she's wearing her bedroom slippers. It's just this chunky little woman with a chicken under her arm. And then the next panel is the city and all the city is drawn just the way I draw cities now. It doesn't, you only know it's a city because the buildings are so jammed in there and cars that are very badly painted down here. And then the last one is a job at last, it says. And the little chunky woman is now on stage with floodlights and an audience and she's dancing with her chicken. <laughs> Okay, what is that all about? Chickens show up all the time. I did once have chickens and, and loved them. Um, but the first whistle I ever made when our, my, our mother was a whistle maker and she made lovely little ethereal birds and I make anything just about else. Um, but the first one I ever made was a little man's head with a chicken on his head. Now, I don't remember what that even looked like. I just remember that I've been doing that for a long time. And when, I, when my hands start making that again, I always feel really happy. And so it's like three moons show up all the time in paintings, chickens and rhinos and little theaters, any kind of little paintings. I like little things. And um, so I got used to doing those small works and now I'm suddenly being able to make bigger ones. They can't be real big because I still don't have enough room to spread them out. I never saw Festival in the Park is my the, my the painting I always wanted to paint my whole life. And it's the mother painting and then the offspring. And I never got to see them together until Maureen hung them up. Wow. And it was an absolute thrill for me to see they're, they're just what I wanted. And the big one out there, the big uh, memory river that's red with the memory running along. That one, in the panels, I saw, I painted them one at a time, jammed into a corner because there was no room for them. And those I didn't really see together until they were hung. So this is a big excitement for me, a big thrill to see you guys here and to think that what I'm gonna have on my tombstone, she did better than expected. <laughs> it really came true today. Yeah, so thank you. This book, it says over there, it's a catalog for the show. It is not, it costs $20, because it's by my publisher, 
right there uh, from Fomite Press. And if you know what Fomite means, you'll understand what he's trying to do. Fomite is any article that is infective that will infect you if you pick it up. So this, uh, like a smallpox blanket or a book without, filled with ideas. And that's, this book is, includes all those paintings of the, of the ark, but these are, this is a, a book about whistles and ideas about, about the great floods that the, somehow everybody in the world had a myth of great floods happening around the same time. And I can't speculate on what happened, but there apparently, according to those cultures, which is most every culture, there was a great flood. And they all talk about it still, and they have a lot of interesting issues. And so that's what those paintings are back there. And here's a book about it. Very nice little book, and you should all buy it immediately. And if not, you can buy it on Amazon, and they'll charge you more. Okay, so that's it. Is there any other thing I left out here? <laughs> Now we're going to look at the individual paintings and whistles of ancient floods. The first is from Greece. It was collected by Ovid and put into his book Metamorphosis uh, from 8 AD. Uh, and then this story, Zeus the god decides to dump water from heaven down to drown everyone because humans have disrespected him. His favorite human is warned and told to build a floating chest to ride out the storm. And eventually the floating chest lands on Mount Parnassus that you can see in the background of the painting and where the favored man Deucalion and his wife repopulate the earth by tossing stones over their shoulders. I didn't include the tossing of stones in the whistle. Uh, but uh, it was painted by many classical artists, and oddly enough, it's also featured in flood repopulation myths from Asia. Uh, the whistle in this uh, set is, has four multi-note chambers, each with many voices, and uh, the water is a whistle, and, the, and Parnassus is a whistle, the cloud that Zeus is pouring the water from is a whistle, and so on. And the Maori myth is from New Zealand. It's an ancient myth of a great flood and subsequent repopulation by the survivors. In it, an evil and jealous boy takes his friends out in a canoe and pulls the plug in the bottom so that it sinks. And as it's sinking, he calls up a massive storm to kill them all and to flood the land and drown everyone else. The only survivor is a boy who knows how to call whales. And in the whistle, you could see him diving into the water. In the painting, he's swimming down. In the whistle, he's diving, he's diving off of the boat and wearing the blue shirt. And he is the only boy who knew how to call whales. And he calls a whale, and it carries him to safety where he finds another survivor, and they repopulate the world. Uh, this myth of whale riding is a popular one in Maori culture, and there are many, many myths about it, um, and, and about the lineage of people who still to this day claim that is one of their attributes. This one's easily recognizable to most people in this culture because it is the Genesis story of the great flood found in the Bible. It's said to be a story that is 4,500 years old. In it, Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, is displeased and he regrets having created humans. He decides to drown them all in a great flood, but he wishes to spare one righteous man, that's Noah. And God gives many instructions for exactly how to construct the ark and how to load it with his family and pairs of animals. And when he and Noah follows instructions and, and they go off on a 40-day journey while it rains. And in the end, the dove comes back with the olive twig and the, Noah's ark lands on Mount Ararat and a dove, a rainbow appears to express God's benevolence. And to this day, the people in Turkey where Mount Ararat is, say that the spot where the ark landed is visible. In the painting, I've done the typical painting of this, only I've just shown a bit of it, of the ark. But you can see the flood coming over the horizon. On the other side, the orange bit is my idea of God. But the flood is coming, and the animals are lining up two by two and going on to the ark. And the 
Only change I made in the story was I added a mother bear with her two cubs. And knowing that only two could go on, she's brought her cubs to be those two. And, um, and then she's put them in line and she's sneaking away so that they will, so that her children will survive. Uh, the whistle is a typical Mount Ararat sort of thing, the boat that is a whistle perched high on top in the various chambers down to the bottom of the whistle. Okay, this is a story of Gilgamesh's Ark. It's a Mesopotamian myth that uh, predates the biblical story by quite a bit. It, it's set down uh, first on a clay tablet on 2000 BC, but it was based on far earlier materials, as was the biblical story. There are descriptions in this cuneiform translation, which was done in, the, uh, in 1857, the cuneiform code, it was bro they broke the code of how to read this, this uh, writing system. And in this story, the Gilgamesh version, uh, God ordered the flood because people were being too noisy and were disturbing his sleep. And as the water rose, the other gods were horrified by the destruction. And the hero of the story has been warned in a dream that a flood is coming, so he builds an ark. And in addition to his family, he's gathered up the skills, people with the skills needed to recreate civilization and a selection of animals. And in the rough seas, they watch as the houses are washed away and everyone drowns except for the occupants of the ark. And they send out a raven and a dove and a swallow and, mount on, and land on Mount Nasir. In my interpretation, the people standing on the ziggurat are watching the sea rise to, up, to, up to drown them. And the ark, I based on a medieval painting of, of an ark, and it's floating past the scenes of destruction. The whistle shows the people on the ziggurat watching the flood rise. This is a story of uh, Manu's flood. It's a Vishnu uh, repopulation, flood and repopulation legend. Vishnu appears as a fish to warn Manu, a good man, of a coming storm. Now this is picked out of a very complicated long story. Finally, Manu comes into the story, the good man, and is warned of the coming storm. And Vishnu tells him to build a boat. And when the flood is high, Vishnu comes again in a fish form, and he tells Manu to tie his boat onto the horn on his head. And he tows Manu and his family to the highest mountain for safety. And this whistle has four multi-note chambers in it. The fish is a whistle, and the mountain is a whistle, and so is the water, and so on. Here's one from the Maasai tribe of East Africa. And this myth has been deeply entangled with Christian missionary teachings, as are many of the myths I found from other cultures. Uh, the story is telling their story of a flood, and then it is the various Christian aspects are inserted into it, quite recognizable as Noah's story. In general, the myths from Africa are very complex and, and hard to understand in a story f format. And so I chose this one, because even though it had additions from another culture, it was a story that was at least understandable to me. It tells about a time when the world was heavily populated, but the people were not minding God and were creating various crimes. But they had refrained from murder until one man hit another man on the head, and at that God resolved to destroy everyone except for the one righteous man who he has chosen to build an ark of wood and enter into it with his wives and his six sons and their wives and some animals. And when they're all aboard, the long rain begins. And finally, uh, he sends out a dove. The man sends out a dove, and he releases a vulture to see if, it, if the flood has gone down and so on. And then the flood is receding and lands on, and it doesn't mention where it lands, but they see four, he sees four rainbows, one in each quarter of the sky, and that signifies God's wrath is over. And this whistle was based on a Nigerian bronze bell shape from the kingdom of Benin. And it has the story at the top with the four rainbows and the birds going out 
and around the base of the animals that surrounded that culture at that time. The Squamish Nation in Canada, Smith, is unique in, in what they decide is important enough to save not just about one man being saved. They see the great flood is coming and they hold a council and decide to build the biggest canoe ever made. And the bravest young man and a young nursing mother with the youngest baby are selected to go along to be caregivers because they've put all their babies into baskets with plenty of food and water and load them onto the boat. And so all the future population is aboard and the task of repopulating the earth will not rely entirely on the two young, the young couple. The remaining parents walk away without looking back so their babies won't see them cry. The waters rise and everybody drowns except for the people on the boat. And after several days, the young man sees a speck far to the south and he paddles toward it and it is the top of Mount Baker and they make their home there to this day. And it's also said, like the Ararat story, that you could see the outline of the canoe halfway up the slope of Mount Baker. The Navajo myth is from the Four Corners region and it is a origin myth involving flooding. So it's not just a flood story, it's a much more complex and very long story. And this version of it was collected by an entomologist because he was studying, I guess, cicadas, and this, they, they feature in this story. And his name is J.L. Caparina. It tells a story of insects slowly evolving into recognizable humans, but they commit immoral acts and the gods get angry at them and expel them from one world after another. In the fourth world, they've angered the uh, gods again, and so the gods send a wall of water to drown them, but they climb up through the fast-growing hollow reeds and escape the floodwaters. And, the, and when they reach the top, they can't get through to the next world, and so a cicada chews the openings so the people can crawl out into the fifth world, where they live until this day. And both the whistle and the painting focus on the, the hollow stems, which I found to be a charming notion to climb up a hollow stem into your new life. The Chinese myth is one of many, many, many Asian flood myths, and this one has a brother and sister who act against their father to release his captive. He's captured and caged the thunder god. And to thank them, the thunder god warns the children he's going to create a flood to drown everyone who angered him. The thunder god gives the children one of his teeth and he tells them to plant it immediately and the tooth quickly grows into a large calabash. He tells them to cut a hole and load the calabash with everything they need to ride out the flood. And then this account disintegrates into a, another topic, which is common in these old stories and particularly about flood stories because oftentimes the only survivors are family members. And so in this case, it's siblings that are left to repopulate the earth. And how could that be? Because incest is forbidden and the talk, it, it disintegrates into a, a discussion of that. Uh, my interpretation of the thunder god shows him at the top beating his drum and whipping up a massive storm and the children at the very top safe in their calabash and the story of getting receiving the the calabash seed tooth and that part of the story is around in bas relief around the bottom of the whistle. Titilix flood is an Australian Aboriginal myth. This version is from the Lake Tyres region. And like so much of Australia's unique flora and fauna, this is unlike any other myth I found. It's short, it's to the point, and it doesn't involve anybody else's mythology. It's just theirs. And it tells the story of a giant frog who swallowed all the water so there was nothing for anyone else to drink. After many animals failed to persuade him to spit the water out, the eel shows up with his con remarkable twisty contorting bodies and it makes the frog laugh. And as the frog laughs, he vomits up the water in a great outpouring, which makes the flood. And then the pelican, which is alternately described as a or aboriginal man in a canoe, saves the whole world of mankind from perishing in the flood by picking up survivors. This is from Akas Marca, Peru, and it's the, another short and concise 
story that I picked out of innumerable impossible to understand <laughs> stories that would challenge even a, a great surrealist painter paint pictures of what was going on in those stories that involved shape shifting and people drowned people turning into fish and and other people Noah's wife turning into a dog and very odd things that I didn't understand and so when I came upon this one I was delighted it is a clear visual story for me and I could understand what they were saying. Uh, it, and it also shows no evidence of having been reshaped by the Judeo-Christian story. The sheep are anxious and they're staring sadly up into the night sky and they won't eat. Finally they tell the shepherd that the stars have told them a huge flood is coming. With his sheep and his children, the shepherd climbs the tallest mountain, and the flood laps at their feet as they reach the top, and no one else survives, and they repopulate the world. And now, I would like to present the Noah Cranky. I said I made those humans, but I don't know why. Fight and quarrel since creation day. Gonna send down water and wash them all away. Oh, Noah. Oh, Noah. God's gonna ride the wind and the tide. God raised his hands to heaven on high. He shook the mountain and he troubled the sky. Moved the stars, he raised a storm. Gonna get rain as sure as you're born. Oh, Noah. Oh, Noah. God's gonna ride the wind and the tide. Oh, Noah's a good man, steady and true. He heard the word from heaven, said, what can I do? He'll be watering as big as a barn, oh Noah, oh Noah, God's gonna ride the wind and the tide. Take off your hat, take off your coat, get your sons working and build a boat, hammer the nails and saw the wood, build a big ark to ride that flood, oh children too and the animals there from cow to kangaroo oh Noah oh Noah time to go the ark is full and it's time to go there's no more room the rain began to fall better shut the door the ceiling was leaking better than the floor oh, oh, 40 days and where were they at the ark was drifting toward air rat oh no oh no god's gonna ride the wind and the tide so the ark it landed high and dry and noah saw a rainbow up in the sky and god showed noah the rainbow sign said no more water but fire next time oh noah oh noah god's gonna ride the wind and the tide And now I have to get down from here without breaking any of my neck. <laughs> okay, so the next thing is that we'll go out there and you can wander around for a little bit and then, uh, and then we'll have tea, delicious tea. It looks very special.